Well, we are on the final day of the Galactic Spiritual Informers Connection Conference and what we were going to do is have a roundtable discussion about some of the things that were raised during one of the presentations by Tony Rodriguez concerning remote viewing because there's a lot of misunderstanding about the capabilities of remote viewing and Tony has a unique perspective on remote viewing because that's something he was exposed to as a result of his abduction phenomenon or him being forcibly recruited into a secret space program and remote viewing was how it all began for him. And, and then I have Elena Danan with me and she's going to be also talking with uh, with us about remote viewing, It's uh, what its limitations are, what its benefits are, what its capabilities are. And finally, we have the legendary Alex Collier with us, who is going to kind of give us his insights into you know, this whole field concerning remote viewing, extraterrestrials, and the other topics that come in. You're listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. Well, I'm going to start off now by um, introducing Tony Rodriguez, who gave a amazing presentation at the Galactic Spiritual Informers Conference about his experiences when he was abducted into a 20 and back program and how it all began with his training in remote viewing at Ingerkern in California. So, Tony, turn it over to you. Thanks. Well, thanks, and I'm honored to be here with all, you, with all of you guys are heroes to me. Um, I presented this year on a trip that I did. I wanted to get, I've always wanted to go back to some of the places that I visited during the 20 years. So it's easily provable that I was in Michigan in my younger years. And uh, I was also in Seattle and in Peru and in Inyo Kern, California, Ridgecrest, California. And so those places I wanted to revisit to try to find evidence. And this year I went to Seattle and then a month later went to Ridgecrest, California and to Inyo Kern and actually turned up a great deal of um, supporting evidence. And the biggest thing is that I found the, the one of the build, I found all the buildings that I remembered that I had not identified on Google Earth or on any map. So I went there physically and recognized the buildings. And what that did was prove it to me, which is, you know, over time, like the less I talk about it, the more I want to forget about it. And it was all became very, very real again. And so I went back home and I only had two weeks before the convention here. And I changed my entire presentation around because it really motivated me to prove, to, to keep looking for the paper trail of those buildings. And in the, in the process of that, I uncovered uh, probably 30 or 40 declassified CIA documents all around Project Grill Flame that was, I was probably subcontracted and they, they called them customers. So I covered the branches of uh, the CIA and the NCIS and the, and the FBI S slash SS and a few others that were classified as customers of Project Grill Flame. So they were paying the Army INSCOM project that was training remote viewers and developing psychoenergetics, which is where it, which is what it is today. It's not remote viewing for the military. It's classified as psychoenergetics, and we were the development test bed of that. And it was a higher classified program than the official Grill Flame program, which was like uh, uh, level four, security level four, I believe, was the, on all the documents. But in the process, I found a... I found a lot of, of where they went with it. So they declassified documents of what became of the program, and it immediately reminded of an incident from last year. So Elena Danan, um, who your your testimony is in real time. So you get a lot of criticism for people that just it's kind of some of the things you say are a big pill pill to swallow, and, you know, let alone my own story, and. Uh, I remember specifically after the convention last year, people online, there were discussions saying there is no Galactic Federation ship. 
you said that it's shielded from remote viewing and in fact that you are shielded from remote viewing and uh, I have a remote viewing group so we meet every couple times a week sometimes but every week and we do targets and it's kind of a basic version it's not the military grade or even a double blind sometimes we double blind but most of the time it's a single blind target and one of the ones that I did well in those documents I found uh, proposed countermeasures research into remote viewing countermeasures dated in 1986 by the army i believe it was army inscom uh, i could revisit the document but i believe it was them where they were funding research into extremely low frequency remote viewing countermeasures so that they could stop the soviets or the chinese or whoever and it reminded me of exactly the episode that you went through there was a time when i my remote viewing team i proposed the question to them and they just had a set of numbers so it was uh, two sets of three-digit numbers on an envelope, and in the envelope it read, what does the Galactic Federation of Worlds starship look like that's in orbit around the world? After I had spoken to you, this was after last year's conference. And they got back drawings, and I immediately uh, got in touch with you uh, through the Internet and asked, does this ring a bell? And they were two balls, and you said, no, no, what you saw was the shielding. And I remember that, so... That's why it all, it's all like the pieces are starting to come together. You know, any little piece, it's a much larger puzzle than just that. But any piece that we can put together to get a view of uh, what's going on, even my testimony dovetails into yours. I also found um, where they were going to research teleportation. So which, which is exactly what Jean-Charles Moyen does as well. And he's had a lot of... Many people can't believe that that's possible. There's a lot of criticism there when they hear that he was physically teleporting. So this was also in the same branch of research, the same funding. And that's the other thing I found the paper trail of fundamentals. So, and then you sent me back a picture that you had, did you, you drew that picture? Yes, yes. That you had drawn and it kind of matches. So they were balls and they had a ring around them. And when you look at the ship, it's actually... Like a, I don't know what you'd call it, like a spinning top with a with a ring a rig ring around it where the drawings were, and then spires on the yeah. top and bottom. But my remote viewers just saw a ball and exactly uh, like the remote being shield that you that you described. Yes, effectively, uh, because you know it would be so easy to just oh let's remote view the mothership of our enemies and see what they're up to. <laughs> that's not that's that's not functioning, you know. All the ships, all the technology used by uh, our allies uh, in space use anti-remote viewing shields. And even at a personal level, I have one too. What is it about? So it's a holographic shield that is going to envelop the, the subject, person, or the, the facility, or the ship. And this uh, hides what's inside and instead projects a hologram that is deceiving. So a remote viewer will reach a target for sure, but what will they will see is either just the, the sphere, the holographic sphere, like actually that was good because you saw the actual shield. But most of the remote viewer, what they would see is a, an illusion or deception. Uh, for instance, a fake ship, or they would try to look inside and they would see a fake movie, you know, they would never get to see what's on the other side of the shield. And same for me, they would think they see me, but they would see an illusion version of me that's doing something else or thinking something else. So it uses holographic technology and frequencies. That's what it is. The, the paperwork I found alluded to, uh, they were beginning to research into um, extremely low frequency, so the, the hertz range, uh, 5 to 8 hertz, not megahertz or gigahertz or kilohertz, uh, but just hertz, which is extremely low range. That's where the research went. And there were a lot of other things, like the the amount of time I had between finding this data and going to Inyokern and, and being motivated like that and then uncovering wasn't enough. I, I'm going to be unpacking it over the next year at least. There's just so much, there's just a wealth of data that came up by, you know, just believing about what I'd gone through, just actually finally, finally settling, not being in denial of it anymore. Okay, so you, you went to Inyokern and, and you were able to 
find the buildings where you were abducted as a child and forcibly put through a remote viewing program with a famous remote viewer that we're not going to name and that uh, you learned these skills and that was critical for you going to the next assignment that they sent you to. That's right. So they had classified it as psychoenergetics and I was reassigned into Peru, but what had gone through was that we weren't, me personally, we weren't great as remote viewers. So we, they were, began drugging us. They were giving us drugs, cocktails of drugs and bringing us close to death. So it was near death experience. So the other, I haven't had a chance to touch on this in the conference at all or any of the presentations, but I found a great deal of data about near death experience research. And it turns out that in uh, a lot of the faces, so not the famous remote viewer that we were mentioning, but other guys in that shop of research are on the, uh, the published papers about near death experience in the nineties. So I was there in 82, um, April of 82 was when I was taken and I was in, in your until about December. And that's the, the project was canceled then. And a new project was started in Leavenworth called center lane. And that was not remote viewing anymore, but psychoenergetics. Um, but the same people that were involved that I remember being involved, published papers on near death experience, psychic psycho, psychoenergetics with near death experience. And there was a video that I found that I can't find again. I'm still looking very hard for it where they were talking about near death, ex great success with near death experience in children. So this is why the project would have been highly classified. I was a space, space I was taken by extraterrestrials as a child and put in. So I would have been classified. We had access to the space program. At one point we did go from a new current to the moon for surger surgical procedures to enhance the ability and then put back. So there was a technology that was limited to the moon that they wouldn't bring down here for security reasons that enhanced the abilities. So you, you as a child were abducted, you were taken to Inyaka, adjacent to China Lake, and in addition to remote viewing, you were exposed to near-death experiences where they would torture you. They would bring you to the point of death. Well, yeah. It, it, just explain how that happened and, and why and why they were doing that. The first time they did it, they were depriving us of oxygen. We had an oxygen tent, and they would lower the oxygen until we lost consciousness. And a bell would they, like just a regular bell, like a um, like a mat like a maitre d, like a hotel, the old scalp ding. The bell you ring for service was hooked up to a monitors. So when we were very close to death, the bell would ring. And so the staff would know, and then it would give oxygen again. We'd wake back up, and then we'd go back, and it went on for hours. And finally, I remember speaking as an adult. I remember, I remember each time I, I went farther and farther into a death experience, into a, the, whatever you want to call it, the dream before death. I went farther and farther where I, at first it was just I felt sick and then woke back up. And then I felt like I was dying and woke back up. And then eventually where I was leaving my body and then being sucked back into it. So my consciousness, I was, it was like I was dying and leaving my body and then being angry after so many times of it happening. And finally, when I was back in my body, I spoke and the lights flickered. There was, it was hence the term psychoenergetics. And I said, let, hey, let him die. And the nurse came over and said, Doc, we've got one. And that was the end of it. That was that's why they they quit. So after that, they were drugging me. It was a drug that they you know in a, the form of an IV, and I would go under and I would just wake up hours later and I had no idea what happened. It's I cover it quite a bit in the my second book, uh, Project Star Maker, on what that experience was like and how I got memories of that. Well, uh, Alex, I know um, in defending sacred ground, I mean you talked about the Dow's uh, being involved in abduction of children or taking this the right. souls and of course you know what, what how does that connect to the sort of experiences tony because tony said he, he was abducted by aliens or graves well you know um the, the Dow's not only abducted children from earth but from other other star systems as well 
And I can remember um, uh, Procyon, where the 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 parents, the mothers, taught their children to row to remote fear. And they were able to send a message out using their remote viewing capabilities. Um, and what they were able to do was to contact the children, were able to contact ships that were passing near the star system using their remote viewing. So it isn't just to look, you can also communicate with it. You know, it's, it's, um, it goes both ways. Um, and then you have Cliff I, the altar report. Even though he was using the internet for language, it worked exactly the same way as remote from viewing. He was able to, to pull out predictive language and even pictures. And um, some of those things actually occurred, even though he wasn't specifically using a remote viewing technique, it still had the same result. Um, and it's just because we are we're unique. We have a lot of hidden skills and talents that we don't often use. And they're of interest to, to the different ET groups. Exactly. We'll exploit those. Well, maybe that, or they want us to teach them. Maybe they don't actually have these skills. You know? Um, and they are extremely curious if, uh, because they can't do it. They abduct our kids so that they can use them to do these things. Well, Elena, I know you had an abduction experience when you were nine. Nine, nine. nine right? Yeah. So, so why? You know, what were the Greys wanting to do with you? Why were they abducting you? What was their goal? They were abducting me as they would abduct millions of children a year for their hybridization program. So they would take my my eggs, which they, they didn't have time to do because I was rescued. Uh, they would take my, so they take the, the eggs of the, the kids, the, the little girl, <laughs> and they, they just use it for uh, hybridization with their own uh, genome and create millions of hybrids. Uh, that was the, the agenda of the, the race when abducted. I, I was lucky to be rescued just the time. Right. So, so they had no desire to kind of exploit your abilities as far as psychic abilities were concerned. You, you're not aware of that. It was just straight hybridization. They just wanted to use you. Yes. It? But when I was uh, in my uh, early 30s, uh, I, uh, late 30s actually, I, uh, after my, uh, my years of working in Egypt, I became engineer. I passed a degree of engineer. So I worked back, went back to France for the French government, uh, CNRS, the Scientific Research uh, Center, National Center of Scientific Research, as an engineer archaeologist. And one day, um, it was in Toulouse, in the south of France, and one day I received a, a phone call. Uh, we're doing evaluation on our personnel, so please, will, will you come um, uh, meet uh, the the administration and do your evaluation and say, yeah, okay, yes. We'll send you uh, a taxi. Oh, okay, it's not in the university. No, no, it's not in your university, it's other buildings. We'll send you a taxi. So, okay, uh, a car picked me up and we drove quite a bit and we arrived. The car drove in the, um, uh, the French uh, Space Center. Uh, that's uh, they have the headquarters in Toulouse, and I went. Oh, wait a minute! That's that's this the space center. It's not the the I am from the the university, archaeology university. So they said no, no, that's that's the address. I need to drop you here. That was weird. So they dropped me in the space center, and I met with. I was um, received by a committee of of women around an oval table, I remember, that was strange. And they said, uh, tell, tell us about your skills. I thought that, okay. So, and I'd start to, to, to talk about what I used to do in archaeology and uh, related to my work. And uh, the, the head of them leaned over the table towards me and, they, and she said, no, your real skills all your skills your and your real skills. I went, okay, so uh, 
it, I was feeling that she was implying psychic skills. And how she knew that I had psychic skills from my childhood, so that was very strange. And I started to talk about my psychic skills and um, I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable because that was not related to my work. And they said, okay, you will write an evaluation of all your psychic skills and send us a document, PDF document, and we'll uh, invite you again to, to examine your, this evaluation. So I just did that. They brought me back to the university. I wrote the document. I was feeling very uncomfortable. Why would they want to know my psychic skill? I work in archa I'm an archaeologist. And that these two things don't go together. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, because, you know, I've been working in archaeology for years and they always forbid to bring anything psychic or paranormal into it or you're fired. Absolutely. I came back and then they offered me to hire me for a remote viewing program, the Space Center. And they say, you'll be well paid. Uh, you will not work all days of the week, but you will have to move in the buildings of the center. And that's where you will live. And you won't be able to get out without authorization. But the pay is great and you will enjoy it. <laughs> I felt that so weird and I said, oh, okay, I think about it. And that day I decided to leave my university and leave everything and move abroad because there was something very wrong that day, I felt. Mm -hmm. Well, um, as far as uh, psychic abilities are concerned, um, remote viewing is one. There's also remote influencing. I think you were talking in your research, you came across some documents about remote influencing because that's the next level up. So you want to talk a little bit about what you found out? That's kind of a modern term. Um, and what I'm learning is that they call the whole thing psychoenergetics or psychokinesis. Um, but what I found out is that <clears throat> there have actually been documents where the army took over. And when they got to the point of psychoenergetics, uh, when they moved it to center lane, they took it out of INSCOM's hands which had a monopoly on the technology and put it in Project Center Lane in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas City, I believe, if I'm saying that right. Um, they gave the ability for all the military to access the technology and train their own remote viewers. So you saw it splinter off into different branches of military, different uh, places. And that was uh, 1985, I believe. Or it began, Center Lane began in 83, January of 83, but they really proliferated. But um, the last bit of uh, information that I uncovered was said that they were, they were putting, they, they were concentrating using parts of the Monroe Institute technique with uh, what they had learned from Grill Flame. And they were manipulating people they had because they could access data from patients in the hospital at Fort Meade. So soldiers that had been injured they were using techniques of color breathing on the soldiers, and then the, the hospital made uh, checks on them, so they had data. So if the soldier healed faster, it would show up in the paperwork, and they had actual data. And then they began to perturb the soldiers and actually make their wounds worse by doing it. And what they found was when they compounded and had more than one, I believe the one of the groups they had was up to nine soldiers. So full-time guys, probably on peripheral drugs, and other uh, minerals, probably on a peripheral uh, diet and everything, full-time full -time psychoenergetic soldiers. And they were, they were synchronized meditating or synchronized their session with the target at the place and actually could kill, induce heart attack and kill the soldiers. And when that happened, the entire thing got classified. That's when you saw the grand canceling of Project Stargate or Gateway, wherever it ended. That's when they canceled it, when they found that they could actually um, affect the battlefield. There were other things in the psycho-energetics uh, research about manipulating time at the target and teleporting items from the target and inserting items tel through teleportation to the target of the, what they were looking at and slowing time down for the target and speeding time up. So interdimensional remote influencing. That, and they had a whole paper. There's an entire paper that I haven't even touched yet that was on 
the mathematics of the interdimensionality that they had uncovered about that. So they were in accessing that through psychoenergetics. There's a great deal. I've already given enough for anybody to go and search on the CIA declassified library to find a great deal of paperwork that supports it, of declassified material. So remote influencing, we've worked on that. I have a group as well. So I do a remote viewing group and it spawned out of a remote influencing group and we tend to heal people. So the group votes on what we do. We do grand targets. We try to dissipate hurricanes and things. But it usually ends up as healing somebody uh, that has an ailment, either one of the group members or a relative. And we've had tremendous success. What we find is that when we do, we get 12 or 15 people to meditate and use the techniques that we use on one target. Uh, We heal people. We have tremendous results. And if you don't keep doing it, we just do one session like that. It will last for a few weeks to a month before they're before the problem either persists or it needs to keep going. And so there are techniques that really do it, but um, that you can really, you can really impact a lot by doing it over time is what we found. But we meet every Tuesday, it's called tier three. And uh, we've had tremendous, tremendous success with it. Alex, anything? Yeah, uh, two things actually that I'd like to address. Um, As far as the using a use of color uh, in the 1930s, there was a uh, eight month study of color healing using gels and light. And they found out that using specific colors on burnt patients and other things that they, they would heal dramatically faster. And if they used the wrong color, their wounds would get worse. Uh, so they learned a lot about that. And then the, the hospital in Philadelphia canceled the program but it just went underground and almost nobody knew anything about where it went. The other thing regarding teleportation, um, starting in 2003, Edwards Air Force Base has has an extensive teleportation program where they're moving gear, equipment, heavy equipment from one hangar to another, you know, and they're, they're generally within a mile of each other. But they have been doing that for quite some time, and it's my understanding that as of late, they've gotten very, very good with that. Now, it's not just equipment, but they can even move troops down, you know, with full packs, gear, armaments, and uh, that program is still going on at Edwards because it's in the middle of the desert. You know, you would never know. Uh, Elena, I know you interviewed Stephen Chua uh, extensively, got to talk to him on the phone, and I think he was put through a, a program of psychic remote viewing, remote influence, as, as I recall. Uh, so, yeah, you want to tell us about Stephen Chua and his abilities and how it relates to this whole remote viewing influencing phenomenon? Yes, Stephen Shua was a super a Singaporean super soldier who was hired uh, in Area 51 to use the power and the abilities of his mind, of his brain actually, uh, with exotic technology, uh, reverse engineer technology. Stephen Shua was could, as same as Jean Charles Moyen, could he could produce an incredible uh, strength and amount of gamma brain waves. And these gamma waves were are necessary to <laughs> use uh, alien technology, and uh, so it he was hired first as a pilot uh, to pilot planes, um, F-15F planes. I thought because he was the only one who could do it without being injected a serum, you know. So because all the other pilots got brain damages from the serum, so. They really found him very useful for all their experiments regarding to his ability. And it's very interesting because they also tried to hire him into to use him into remote viewing uh, activities. But that that's interesting because he was naturally gifted in producing gamma brain waves. So actually, I would have a question. Uh, maybe Tony, you could answer. Would the, the pro- 
producing gamma brain waves be uh, make remote viewing easier? Would it be related some, somehow? There, there was a stage that they were monitoring our brain waves. So in the program that I was in, there was a state towards the end of it. So I always remark on the trauma-based mind control program, and program. But after we finished that, it really went into psycho remote viewing and psychoenergetics, and they tried many different versions on us. But they were monitoring our brain waves at one point uh, to take data. So um, they had us on a diet on a specific diet and they were giving us minerals he explained to us that they were giving us minerals and there were a few drugs that they were giving us that were not they were mild it wasn't uh, i remember the i remember having anxiety of taking whatever they gave us that i was going to uh you know be totally incapacitated and I, they were very mild like an like on ibuprofen so it was a mild drug that they were giving us and then in conjunction with the Monroe Institute, with the HemiSync, and with with visuals, there were there were visuals that they gave us too. There were lights in the room that would flash on and off on us um, that we would kick and do out of body. So I'm not sure um, the gamma gamma brain waves if that came into play um, back then or not. Um, I was felt like a guinea pig in the thing. But I, I find it inter interesting that you're talking about a serum being injected to stimulate brain brain activity. Same as Stephen Chua, the pilots were injected a serum to stimulate their gamma brain waves in that particular project. But that's interesting, I think, the correlation. Yeah, yeah um, from what I can tell, from when I look at what I was going through in Peru, when I was actually um, field operational, to use big military terms, was field. I became field operational at a certain point where I was out of the training and they put me in the field and I was in Peru and basically a remote viewer for shipments of cocaine in South America from one place to another. Um, it was, it, from what I can, I researched it to say what would do what, what I remembered experiencing and I found some data on ketamine that they were using the anesthetic ketamine in Vietnam on soldiers and there was a phenomenon because you don't need to monitor the oxygen levels with a ketamine uh, anesthetic where reverse one so they would give soldiers field surgeries in a battle live in the battle they would administer ketamine and what they were getting was prophetic um, the soldiers while they were under were saying tomorrow the battle at three o'clock is going to they were getting prophecy from the soldiers and then immediately they studied it for a very short time and then they they quit using it. The government came in and quit quit using ketamine. Um, so the CIA took that over. Um, I forget where the article is that I found that. I'll have to re revisit that. In the very beginning, you know, in 2015 and 16, when I was researching what I'd been through, is when I discovered that stuff. Uh, and then, like I said, since I've gone there recently, I'm kind of revisiting it. So, um, but that was kind of what it was like. I was being put under and it, it was like being put under for a surgery where you're just knocked out and I would wake up and my handler, the people in charge of me would be impressed by what I was saying. And I, I was speaking in all different manners, like different personalities while I was under. Alex, you had a point to add to that? You know, some of this technology is, it sounds very reminiscent of the Bob Talk project. Now regarding the Academy, and uh, looking for future events. You know, one of the things that is never, ever talked about is that the POWs in Vietnam were used in exactly that way. And the VC were there, but who was really running the program were Russians in Czechoslovakian military uniforms. So the Russians could say, well, we were never here. But they were running very similar pro programs on American POWs because they were still connected to their units. You know, psychically, they were still connected to the units and their friends. And they were looking for information about troop movements and where they were going to be. They ran that program. And many of the POWs that came back talked about those cannabis experiments. And that's what they were looking for. Well, uh, this question 
probably be my last, is um, kind of ask the three of you, given your ex respective experiences, is remote viewing an effective tool to find out what the extraterrestrial agenda is or agendas are? You know, some people claim there are shields that ETs have and they put out uh, cover cover images to, to throw off the remote viewers, to trick them into whatever they want. Others, others say that uh, regardless of what the ETs do, uh, remote viewers can go in there and find out exactly what's going on and penetrate the minds of the ETs. So, yeah, what, what is your take on that? Well, let's start off with you, Tim. So we were trained... When, when we were trained in the program, we were taught that if we encountered another mind while we were out of body, that the strategy was to out-create them. So if you were out of body and another entity came up and was attacking you, you would just imagine the opposite of the attack. And it, it was, uh, I always call it the Felix the Cat. You had your magic bag and you pulled out what you needed. And it didn't matter what if, if an entity put you in a box then you became small to sneak out. And if you were in glass, then you became light to shine out to escape. That's how we were trained. We were literally trained on that, to always out-create. The creativity in that state of mind when you're out of body was actually the supreme strength to have. What to be whichever, um, whichever mind was more creative was going to win. So it was about creativity. Um, I forget where I was going with that With that, on the end of it. So to answer your question, if remote viewing is applicable to that, absolutely. So remote viewing, what I've found, it's easy. for Everybody can play basketball. Some people are better than others. And remote viewing is the exact same way. And it, it deals more with practice than it does with natural ability. So the more you remote view, the better you get at it. So a one-time course for a month doesn't produce the same skill as somebody that does remote viewing for a year, a year long. Um, but I found that the creativity of the question of the target of remote viewing is what's going to determine that. So if they have, like Elena has described, countermeasuring around their ship, there is a time that the ship did not have the countermeasures on, and you can remote view that. So you can you can time. Well, I'm just I'm saying you're shaking your head, but what I, what I mean by that is there's a way to be creative, depending on on the target. So it's it's what you target. Targeting in the remote viewing is the more challenging aspect of it. Any everybody can be given a target and get some data on it. And then when you have many people, you can cross-reference the data. But creating the target cr creatively is how how you would go about that. So um I and that's the challenge. Creating targets is actually the hardest part of um, what I found. Lynn? Well uh I would say uh regarding remote viewing extraterrestrial ships facilities and, and military factions, I think such is real. To what I know is a waste of time because everything is shielded. Everything is shielded. And the ships, as soon as they are built, they build with integrated with this holographic shield. So what you will see, you will see the target. You may see where it is, but sometimes they have been cloaked. But if you see, you can, the, it's the easiest and the only information you can get is the fleets are there, the ships are there, that, that's all you can get, the location, the position. But because of these shields, you will see an illusion. You will never see what's inside or even consciousness, you know. So, uh, but that's when it comes to, I tell you, technology, shields, facilities, and um, sensitive people such as, well, me, I have a shield, but also all the military, all the soldiers, um, etc. That's my point of view. Okay, here's my understanding. When you're dealing with three-dimensional extraterrestrials that are you know, telepathic, they know when somebody's in their head. They immediately can shut you down. All right, because they're used to having people in their head and they're used to inviting people and communicate with them directly. This is where the shield is. If they shove the shield down, it's done. If you're looking at a fourth or a fifth density extraterrestrial, they've got a chance of being able to, to remote view 
anything that's going on, not only in their ship, or but what's going on in their head, because you have no idea what time they're actually in, because they're not in our dimension. You know, good luck with that. So I agree totally with Alex. Yes. The, the other thing is that we as humans here doing remote viewing are a, the minority in the field, in the ether of remote viewing. So the ETs have massive, extremely talented, very advanced crews of remote viewers as well. So they use them themselves. So we found many remote views. The backside of the moon is a don't do. Um, there are there, a lot of people have reported remote viewing it and they only see ETs removing the back. They see that they maybe a screen, maybe a screen moving. Like but they they always run into a block, so it always ends up with a room of grays at a table. That seems to be that when we remote view the backside of the moon and look for bases, you see a room of grays at a table and them looking at you. Like that's a common common description of that remote view. So we are, you know, it's it's like learning to drive, and we're like very not good at it. So, uh, you know, at our level, we grow up not believing that it's real. All, you know, yeah. little kids don't grow up believing it's real. These other beings are growing up being taught from birth how to remove you. And it's that skill level. There's a disparity in the skill level. And, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that other uh, established uh, groups of remote viewers now, like I, I, uh, I, uh, I'm a big fan of Farsight. I think they're the gold standard right now in public remote viewing. There are others uh, that you've worked with that you had presented with. There are other guys that have a lot, great deal of data that are way ahead of where I'm at. Uh, but that's what I found is that we are still kind of like I got the training. Mm -hmm. so. Well, that that was actually Farsight claims that regardless of any kind of shields, any kind of attempt by extraterrestrial people that view us remote viewers out, that they have the protocols or the training to be able to crack through that and find out what's really going on. And I'm sceptical of that, I mean, based on what right. others have said. Um, but, yeah, I mean... I mean, if you have a... Let's give an example of a third-dimensional um, advanced extraterrestrial race that uses um, their minds to navigate their locations... So what they're basically doing is they're remote viewing a time and a place, and then the ship will go there. Okay, um, that is very very sophisticated uh, technology that they have, especially with their mind. Their minds are so strict; they're so um, sure about what it is they're seeing and where they're going, whether it's in present time, uh, past time, or future time. Um, I just don't see how we would have the ability or the protocols to override that kind of a focused consciousness uh, because they're navigating across space to a very specific place. I would like to uh, follow up, uh, Alex. Uh, as, as you know, it's, it's good to explain that, you know, the telepathy or when you can read everyone's mind by remote viewing. It's a different level of brainwave than piloting a ship. Okay. And so that technology, that, that focus, that level of uh, where you do that in your mind, uh, it's not the, the level at, at which you communicate. So just want to follow up to really confirm that, you know, people cannot hack this, get there, you know, they, they can't, can't access this because it's right. not communication level. That's why you're here, because you're the legend. <laughs> he's my, he's the, my mentor. He's, I'm here because he's he, he was here first, <laughs> okay? <laughs> he's yeah. the legend. She no longer needs a mentor because now she's the legend. <laughs> well, well, yeah. that, well, that brings me then, just to finish this up, uh, you know, this is the final day of the Galactic Spiritual Informers Connection. So what's what's your biggest takeaway or takeaways from this conference? Maybe we can just go around. So starting off with you, Tone. Um, it's growing. So yeah. the, the information is, it's working. The information we're putting out there, we started long ago, is proliferating. In my case, I, last year I asked how many people are familiar with me. 
and maybe a less than a third of the crowd raised their hand this year i said who's familiar with me and almost all everybody raised their hand and many more people had read the book so the information's proliferating in my in my case and in ours you know it's growing and this is exactly what we need this is you know people need to get their head around what's coming so it's very hard for people that have no background in it they're skeptical and so that's what we're doing we're kind of cracking into it and we're making it's working well my my feedback uh, at the end of this second jsic is uh, not only the the, the the amazing frequency of everyone all the attendees uh, to being together and bonding by the heart finding each other and all the, the stars it gathering that there's this but as well regarding the, the speakers and our uh, presentations everyone got a piece of a different piece of the same puzzle in each each one's domain of expertise and that was absolutely extraordinary that we could complete each other uh, by bringing our own information and everything we, we we brought this closure closer because we got together that was very impressive and wonderful alex my takeaway is uh, the level of information has really matured and each of the presenters have really honed their presentations and they're more on point they're more on focus and the information has so much depth that the audience it it lights light bulbs in their head which is why we had so many people with so many questions and the questions were good except for a few who just rambled on about stuff okay but you know that happens and um what's really interesting is that because of the level of maturity of the information and the depth of it it automatically changes the audience's perspective and what it does is that it creates a field of disclosure and that type of consciousness that kind of focus will draw more information to it and it will cause a a uh, a larger stronger field of disclosure you know um, i mean tony you've come a long way since last year really have it's just a, it's profound and you know elaine is rewriting all the levels she's taking everything to the next level and, and dan dan willis and um just everybody that was participating in it uh you all took everything to the next level and, and that's the way it has to be you know we if we keep if you guys keep raising the bar then the audience will also keep raising the bar with their consciousness and that creates the field you know the quantum field of consciousness which will not only draw more people to it, but it will also draw them and it'll draw the end result, which is more disclosure. So, yeah. And I include you in that, Michael, as well, Thank obviously, because you. you're a legend now. Thank you. By the way, just got an award for ex his exopolitic work. <laughs> yes, he did. Why don't, why don't you show everybody the book down here? Okay. That's very hard, Michael is very hard. That's, that's, that's handed, handed that's right. to me by my... Uh, uh, another living legend, Alex Collier, uh, this, this award uh, for contribution to the exopolitics field. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the conference is a great way for star groups, star seeds to gather, to share their information, to meet one another. And, you know, there's just an incredible family feeling that was there. You know, the, the content, the information was amazing. Uh, there's a lot of synergy amongst the speakers. You get a lot of education and a lot of new information. But, you know, I just found that the kind of family 
feelings that you, you get there. They're really, And it's all about connection. And you know, in my presentation, I, I talked about star families, star groups, and that it really is all about getting out of that mindset that, you know, you're an individual star seed on your own, fighting the good fight here on Earth to like, no, you're, you're part of a star group that has come here to work as a group to improve this planet, to bring light to this planet. So find your group, find your family, and you will together, you know, have so much more effectiveness than you would as, uh, as a single star seed on your own. Well, we had some new people this year and they were blown away at the um, unity and the synchronicity of all the speakers and how well they interacted with each other and, you know, everybody's energy and movement, everything just moved in sync. And in turn, they found it very easy to move into that space as well and become welcome and to move with the same resonant frequency. And that is always a good sign, you know, because you nobody had to work that hard. You know, it just flowed real easy and, and it all meshed and became a compendium of ideas. So for those that didn't watch the, the conference, uh, it was online and not all the presentations were uh, available online. I think you can watch the, the replays that will be available uh, on spiritual, uh, galactic spiritual informers connection dot com com something like that that's <laughs> anyway uh, so the link and there <laughs> yes we'll put the link in there somewhere so thank you for listening in to this episode of exopolitics today and i want to thank uh, uh my fellow attendees uh, tony rodriguez elena danan and alex collier for sharing uh, their vast knowledge on these difficult topics you have been listening to ExoPolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. Join or start a conversation in the comments. Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com. Mm -hmm.